Okay. Well, in that case, let's move on to a, a quick uh, reflection on the um, session. Um, so, Samir. Thank you. Um, I was just kind of like scribbling down notes um, throughout, so I don't, you know, I, um, don't expect anything too, too joined up in terms of my thinking. But um, one of the things that I was reflecting on in particular with um, um, Joe and um, Peter's presentations was about um, the kind of the data architecture and systems and categories that we create and how uh, and how they can um, almost, I was, I was thinking of the term of the, the concept of path dependence as um, I do a lot of work both within NHS services and um, local government services. And interestingly, the, the NHS doesn't record data relating to gypsy and traveler communities because the NHS uses the 2001 census categories for ethnicity. So despite the fact that gypsy and traveler communities have the lowest life expectancy of any ethnic group in the UK, as far as we're aware, they, they are not, their data is not recorded in that sense on a routine basis, um, and that 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 strikes me kind of very much in terms of of actually kind of thinking about what are the what are the systems that that we are creating and what's the impact going into the in the future. Are we when we create the systems, are we thinking about the the path that we that we take and the impact that, all, that it will have on those categories? Um, one of the things that sort of that question about um, recording of of religion was that we we did some work a while back with NHS blood and transplant about um, attitudes towards organ donation and, and NHS um, blood and transplant had they commissioned some like um, market research these these look like the, the hardcore people who like you know try and sell you like Maltesers or beer or um, all all the kind of the the, the sinful things and. Uh, they, they, uh, what was really interesting was they broke down the kind of the the response and data both by ethnicity and by um, religion as well, and look, looked at the messages. What what would land for each of these of these groups in terms of of persuading you to part with your organs when you die? And it, it was fascinating. The, the the same message um, that would land really well for um, a black African Christian would like. Um, would absolutely fail with a European Christian or um, a message that would work with a, um, with an Indian Muslim would uh, w uh, work less well with a Pakistani Muslim. And, and these were, were incredibly interesting kind of dynamics that they were starting to look at. Um, and oh, I suppose like last one before I take too much time um, was around so the, someone asked a question about um, integration and, and, and segregation, and kind of where the UK debate is at. We're still very much, I feel, in in a um, well, this, you know, this is like the Louise Casey thing of uh, of where apparently you know like black and red ethnic communities are you know all, all, all to, to blame for being isolated. And stuff. I'm, I'm I'm really kind of quite mean about it because I really object to it. Um, <laughs> and at, at the time, I. Um, we were asked to kind of like you know, write a response, and I did one saying, "Well, you know, why, why, why are we so focused on on um, black and white ethnic people living together when we're not so concerned about rich people living together? <laughs> you know, actually, why would why aren't we talk about segregation by by wealth and the kind of like um, like perverse outcomes that happen when that happens?" <laughs> um, so, yes, I think I think that's I've spoken. Thank you. Thanks. That's great. I wonder if any of the speakers uh, wanted to respond to yeah, go for it. Uh, wanted to respond to any of those points that Sam has made at all. I mean, I think it is a really interesting point. It's a bit weird. I'm standing quite <laughs> squeezed in here. Um, it's a really interesting point that you make about <coughs> some of the talk, uh, some of the things that were picked up by Peter's talk around ethnic density and the question around social connectedness. That there is this sort of um, fairly politicised debate around segregation versus ethnic diversity and this focus on communities of people living in one area. We know from lots of work that's been done that these areas um, can are sort of immensely um, important in terms of social support, buffering against racism and discrimination. That's something that, you know, I suppose all of the talks are sort of tacitly sort of making reference to. And so it is an interesting thing from a policy perspective that, you know, there's this sort of dispersal policy on the one hand without really thinking about what this means in terms of 
people and essentially engendering a sort of social isolation that can have these very adverse health effects or even other sorts of effects. And did you? Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, just, just thinking about that as well, I was uh, you know, reflecting on to what extent, um, you know, does it reflect kind of uh, past at attitudes towards um, or past kind of like approaches to policy in terms of, uh, for example, slum clearance, the idea that, that the poor gathered together are, um, are in a state of moral decay or of physical, you know, there's kind of Victorian paternalism that kind of exists and actually we must break up the, the poor in these communities. They're, they, you know, they're, they're dangerous to health, dangerous because of, of violence. You look at the kind of the, the attitude towards Jewish communities in the, the end of the 19th century was like, oh, no, these are a bastion of, of, of communists and, and terrorists and such. And then look at some of the kind of the attitudes towards um, he had to, um, God, what's his name? They're like, right, like the columnist in the time of the day talking about, casually talking about like bombing Tower Hamlets because, you know, that's, that's clearly where all of the. God Little, yeah. I shouldn't make this name again. Because I don't think it's like. They just don't give them the oxygen of publicity. Um, but, yeah, you know, kind of, uh, uh, but I suppose to, like, to what extent the kind of the, the policy um, debate is actually kind of. <laughs> come back and around to this kind of um, Victorian kind of attitude. I, I do think that we need to look at representation within policy making as well, that, you know, it's, it's actually, it's the lack of representation that is really driving um, exclusion. So if people were represented, not just within the research pro process, but within public services, within policy making circles, um, you know, there would be that accountability and there would be that representation of voice, which is really missing at the moment. I completely agree, and this sort of picks up the issue around data, which I think came up in lots of the talks around, if we don't collect the data, we don't know what's going on, but then these categories, the very categories that are used to sort of monitor some of these issues around inequalities, fluctuate and change, you know, the whole business of um, the exclusion of um, gypsy and traveler communities based on the 2001 census and routine data, and I think your talk very much sort of picked up on that. So. It almost has to start from the top as well as be sort of bottom, you know, sort of bottom down and top up, you know, both ends really. Any any comments from um, the audience at all, just to, to pick up any of these points that have been raised? This question over there. Thank you. Um, I think my point is mainly on the kind of data collection. So I work with a lot of people on the front line who have to do the data collection on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think it was mentioned that, oh, a lot of work has been done in terms of people feeling secure. But I think it's also worth looking at the current environment at the moment around immigration, migration, the fear with the Windrush scandal. We actually started to get cases of people refusing to depart with their data because they feel there could be some kind of racist or apartheid-like application for it. Does it mean... You know, we saw what happened with Grenfell. So there is this sort of the way that the economy is going, the way the politics is going with Brexit. People are getting very, very scared about sharing that data. So no matter what's happening at the top, frontline staff who are overworked are just not able to do it. And people are not able, are not volunteering, volunteering this information either. So I just thought I'd just throw that out there. Yeah, that's a really important point. I, I don't know if anybody on the panel wants to I'm respond to that. It's very, difficult to do, it's very difficult to do refugee research here if you're using health records data because it, it, it can't be recorded. Um, so all we can do is look at particular groups. We can look at things like country of origin and, and then assume that people would be refugees for that reason. Um, but also in Scandinavian countries as well, it's difficult to get information about refugee status, um, which, which is important because that there are these health differences that, that we need to know something about uh, to be able to tackle them. I think the issue with um, data, kind of uh, big data studies, is who has decided what the research questions are and who is looking at the research questions and where is the voice of the people from those communities. So I think there's really a, a, a really big, you know, a convincing case to be made for mixed method studies where that voice is introduced and the findings are you know, the reflections on the findings come from the people within those communities about what needs to happen, what the issues are, what the explanations are. There's a lot of big data studies looking at these kind of Scandinavian and UK data sets um, where we're just guessing what the reasons are for the trends that are found and, and we really need to be better at, m at more mixed method approaches, I think. Completely agree. You need that sort of qualitative approach to really get under the skin of the data, which you're right, is completely missing from some of the routine 
um, work that goes on. I know Peter, you're sort of involved in work with that, like in those in that sort of realm as we are too. And large groups of, of black and ethnic minority mental health service users and we talked about the implications of um, of what we were doing and, and how to interpret the data um, it's difficult to do because sometimes this this sort of analysis becomes very very technical and you wouldn't expect anybody other than the people that do that kind of work to necessarily uh, gets a grips and and why would they with the, the sort of statistical problems that you have and often trying to get across the fact that you're still reliant on very crude categories because of the nature of uh, quantitative analysis is difficult and that, that we just have to be very mindful of how easily misinterpreted the kind of health records data we have is. Um, and we're, we're stuck with these crude tools, but as long as we know, you know, have at least some idea what's going on behind the data, then um, we, we can use it uh, in a helpful way. Um, just a point to lead, following on from your point about the the hostile environment. When it, I mean, I, it's really shocking, isn't it, that you know it started off years and years ago where people didn't understand the importance of recording data like ethnicity data, and you know they they just um, and they'd leave it blank because they didn't think it was important. And then people moved to thinking it was important, and I think that one of the difficulties for researchers is that you you can't separate your own research from the policy environment. And that, I mean, you know, things like not taking, you know, I can really understand why people would feel reluctant to share that information when they know, you know, particularly like Windrush, where people who have obviously had, a, you know, have been so appallingly treated that it, it can make people, you know, feel, feel quite dreadful. I, I can imagine people would feel quite reluctant to do that. Um, and it's just quite difficult when policy is meant to be neutral, you know, in terms of that sort of thing, when actually it isn't. Any other points or questions for the panel? Oh, there's one over there. Thank you. Um, I would just like to congratulate the speakers for very good presentations. I am somehow concerned that I personally have been in involving mental health and challenging the system for the last 40 years. And it would appear to me that not much has changed. We are doing a lot more research, but most, a lot of this research has done back in the 1970s. And I am not hopeful that the legislations that were in place back then has changed. And therefore, I would ask you all to consider not just what is new or what you're doing now, but look at what happened from the 1959 Mental Health Act, which was brought in to put black and ethnic minorities into the mental institution and to send them back to where they were born. Look at that again. Thank you very much. That's a really good uh, point, and I, I wonder if everybody on the panel would like to comment on that. So, what? what so we we've, we've been essentially finding the same sorts of things for decades. What needs to happen? What? How can we change things? I feel like with mental health research and policy, that um, as a country and as um, a generation of people, that we have reached a crisis point. And unfortunately, with all races, that there is a crisis point with mental health problems. And it's unfortunately has gotten to a point where young people are dying from mental health problems day, day by day. And people in media are noticing this. Policy people are noticing this. Every, every, every I think, sphere of society is noticing it. And I, and I do believe that there is still a long way to go, but change is happening and people are beginning to make active changes to what's going on. And it is a very good point of actually going back, not necessarily doing something brand new, but going back to the root of what's going on because um, working with people in hospitals, seeing um, a dispor disproportionate amount of black males still being detained right up until this month is ridiculous to see. And I do know that more um, 
more policy and people from, uh, people at the top in the NHS are beginning to work on this. So we can just be hopeful that things are changing. However, it's a slow change, but it's changing. Um, I, was, I, I think that's a really good point about the, the same themes occurring over decades and decades. Um, one of the, when I held one of the focus groups for, for my study, um, somebody pointed out, it's a piece of research done by a, a psychiatrist called Ron Littlewood and, uh, and Lipsedge, and they, they, they wrote a book about uh, ethnic minority differences in, in severe mental illness um, based on qualitative interviews in the 70s and, and 80s. Um, I was aware of that, but I hadn't looked at it for a long time, and I went back to that, and a lot of the themes were exactly the same. It was a really, as you say, nothing had changed. I think what's what's a bit different and, and useful now is that we have potentially a lot of very rich data, so we can come up with figures that might sound a bit dry to a lot of people, but are potentially um, have a big impact on the government and policymakers. So we can say, yes, this is the fact. There's this increased risk of uh, schizophrenia in this group, and uh, it's potentially possibly because of these factors. Um, I think that that's made a big difference. The fundamental things are still the same. For me, I think the improvements would be if we move from a model of rather than sort of user involvement, but and or to actually make it real, you know, not just having consultations with people feeding back about results, but ways in which people can actually change policies and making uh, you know, things like shops always do these things like, you said, we did. And, you know, that could work for clinical commissioning groups, that could work for, for social care departments, where people can see that their views have really made a difference, because otherwise people will just feel it's tokenistic and they've got better things to do with their time. So I suppose they've got a short to medium term and then a long term response the short to medium term I, um, I feel very much from from the experience that that I've had in working in this area that um, that black and minority ethnic led voluntary sector organizations civil society organizations mental health organizations have, have been eviscerated by by cuts um, over the you know, kind of since since 2010 um, and that a significant increase in in funding and of of support um, at a community level would have a dramatic impact in the kind of short to medium term um both in terms of advocacy and in terms of providing services that aren't so scary that you're worried about you know am i going to be sectioned am i going to spend years in an institution somewhere i think longer term the the issue facing us is how our how our economy is changing and if you believe the kind of the, the the thing around like the robots will will take over and do most of the work then there's then there's actually a challenge around you know our, our welfare state was was created and maintains us as a workforce primarily and if we are no longer a workforce or as, as needed as a workforce then actually what uh, is there the incentive for, for for a system under under capitalism in that in that sense to to maintain us in that in that way, and, and therefore, what values, should, what values and systems should we be looking to to try and um, and achieve something that is about like valuing people beyond beyond that kind of the, the worker within the that, that economic system? It's, it's a bit it's a bit of a vague thought. I just kind of it came to me now, so I thought I'd share it. <laughs> Any more remarks? <laughs> I agree that we need we need. Um, a deep level of social change, really, in the UK and globally, really, that um, it should be an embarrassment for people working in policy practice to not be representative of the communities that they are that they are working with or for. It should be um, seen as unacceptable in the same way as gender inequality is being seen as un un unacceptable. Um, all white decision-making groups should not be um, should not exist, you know, in, in areas, especially in areas where they're deciding for the whole country or for areas where there, where, and there always is ethnic diversity, wherever you go, you know, there is going to be ethnic diversity. It should be an embarrassment, it should not be acceptable. And we're achieving those kind of um, 
changes in attitudes in relation to gender, we need to achieve the same kind of things when it comes to ethnicity and, and religious identity too. And I think um, researchers, you know, research is actually one of the areas where cuts are not being made that much, actually. We're, we're quite well funded in terms of the amount of money that is available nationally. And I came to research from the voluntary sector and was amazed at the amount of money, you know, that researchers had access to. So I've spent a lot of my working career trying to channel that research, that research money into communities um, making opportunities for voluntary sector organisations to work as part of, you know, developing that as part of the research design because that is where the voice of those communities is going to be well represented. And also it's important for research teams to think about, you know, it to be unacceptable to be doing research, um, you know, that, it, that is supposed to be representative of populations or of ethnic minorities that do not include people from those communities. You know, this should be a kind of a value that we have within our society. And it's up to us as researchers, I think, to promote that.